investigations. And I think that um, it, if you haven't, it, 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 it would be highly instructive for you uh, to go through those uh, and to read them and the recommendations that were made to the State Department, uh, who headed them up, uh, some of the most highly credible, both military and uh, diplomatic service uh, individuals in our country. So uh, I, I would just offer that back to you. I don't think this is the setting to get into Benghazi, uh, but I, I would suggest that you, uh, uh, that you, uh, you know, uh, uh, avail yourself uh, and, uh, and read uh, the investigations, who headed them up, the recommendations that were made, the recommendations that are being carried out. Um, uh, look, any time we lose any American, any American, anywhere, uh, is, uh, is something that uh, diminishes our country. Thank you. Let me just add that the evaluation was done by Admiral Pickering, Admiral Mullen and Ambassador Pickering um, identified some 40 different deficiencies all of which have been now addressed by the Department of State. There is no question that embassies around the world were, in some cases, vulnerable. And there have been steps taken now to secure them um, to a much greater extent than they had been previously. Go ahead, sir. My name is Guy Hichi Bostic. I'm a Korea, uh, Marine vet, uh, Korean vet. And uh, I'm also a member of the Family and uh, Veterans Family Council, and <clears throat> I've had 25 years of patient care, outpatient care in Menlo Park in Palo Alto. So I have all positive things to say. But my question today is that uh, I had a personal sort of situation that just recently happened, is that um, I wanted to see a doctor about uh, knee replacement and I didn't know whether it was serious or if I was doing something to do it. So I called in and they gave me an appointment. They said, uh, to see this doctor who only is coming on once a week, uh, Mondays, that they were filled up so it was for a month. So I asked them if they had any cancellations. And uh, they said that they didn't have, have a system for cancellations, that I had to call in every day or every day before the Monday. So I just want to have the question is, is why is that we don't have a system so that veterans that want to give uh, appointments and, you know, each appointments a little faster, that uh, they can't call in and say cancellation, but they told me there's no system between the departments and they don't, this people who are looking for complications. So I think this, thanks, thanks very much for bringing that up and thank you for your service on our advisory council. We really appreciate that. So one of the uh, one of the circumstances that this current situation across VHA has highlighted for us is sort of who reports to whom as far as our different clerks and scheduling access and and so um, our nurse executive is looking at that with our uh, associate chief of staff for ambulatory care to centralize and standardize our scheduling practices and that effort is underway right now to address that very issue. You know, Lisa, it, it does seem that, and this is probably across the country to the extent that it's happening here, as our veterans are aging and there's greater need for hip replacements and knee replacements, we're not necessarily geared up system-wide to provide that service. Is that a fair comment? So, you know, we, we talk a lot. I, I didn't have time to get into it in my presentation about this concept of a value stream, and we we have we are very fortunate here that we have a, a earlier veteran commented on our geriatric services and how superior they are. But you know, just sort of we we have so many veterans, as you say, that are you know getting older, and the need of the old the needs of the older veteran. How do we map that out, so to speak, so that you know any veteran entering our system at any of our sites, they're going to get that same level of care. And, and what are the differences in the way that those veterans need to be seen and treated versus veterans of other eras? And I, and I would say you know that is a work in progress for us. We, we spent a lot of time thinking about it, but I think we have to take some more concrete action so that a veteran entering our system, it wouldn't be, I've heard this over and over again in this town hall, it's great feedback for us about, 
you know, in the VA, you get what you get if you know how to get it, versus it's extremely transparent, all the kinds of services that we offer and exactly how you can receive those from us. So that's definitely an improvement we need to make. It's a, from the outside looking in, I can't help but uh, observe the following, that you have a full range of services. Uh, but, you know, we live our lives in increments. I mean, one day we may have a headache and we just take aspirin. Uh, but if you're a certain age, maybe your knee or your hip is going out. And it seems to me that the system, um, uh, that there's not a, a, a connectedness from one to the other. It, it seems like it, people kind of fall between the cracks as they're trying to just simply schedule something. Now, I know scheduling um, is not the easiest thing to do, uh, but it seems to me that it, it has to be far more seamless. Uh, if you call at night, they can't do scheduling. If you're going to go outside of the VA for, uh, say, the surgery, you're, it, you're in another bucket or another basket and another process. And uh, I think that, that's, that, uh, uh, that this all needs to be tied together. Why? Because this is the way people live, live their lives. I mean, they, they don't live it according to an old system or well, an think, older I, system. I think the good news for the veterans here today, though, is that the VA is highly incentivized to provide you all of those services under one umbrella, perhaps within the VA and outside the VA. Yes, there's a lot of improvements that we need you know, if you're a Kaiser patient, they can give you your medical information on a thumb drive and you can bring that to Sutter and Sutter could stick it in their computer and see all of that information. Because of our information security rules, we don't have that kind of transparency. I'm hoping that that is not too far away in the, in the future for us. But we have all the incentives to do everything that you all need for the rest of your lives and not for any profit motive so I think some of the situation that you described, that's true of all of healthcare. And having the right incentive is the beginning. The PAC teams, the patient aligned care teams, where you have the physician, the nurse, more fully integrating the clerk, the social worker, the embedded behavioral health uh, professional. That's not something you see in all healthcare systems. I, I think, are our systems perfect? Absolutely not. Do we have a lot of what I think are relatively easy technological fixes of things like phone systems and scheduling systems. I mean, that's really the easy part, but that whole idea of we're incentivized to do everything we can for you at whatever stage you are at in your life and those unique medical circumstances you have from your military service, we're very well positioned to do that. Is everything all organizationally aligned perfectly right now? No, and uh, you know, hopefully the good news of this crisis is that that path will be much faster now with more resources and more authorization. Sometimes it's not just money, it's just authorizations to be able to move quicker than we've been able to in the past. I, I guess, Lisa, my question though is, are we better served contracting with physicians, orthopedists at Stanford to do hip replacements or have dedicated personnel within the VA Palo Alto to do hip replacement. So I, I think it's a combination. It, you know that that um, if you're a veteran that's in lives in Sonora, mm -hmm. having a great relationship with the Sonora Community Hospital, perhaps you'd rather have your hip replacement done at that community hospital closer to home. You'd rather have your PT and OT closer to home. So having that flexibility of not just you know, I think the VA sometimes gravitate, gravitates to a one-size-fits-all. So sometimes contracting with the affiliate, sometimes with a community entity closer to the veteran's home. But the other piece of it, as we did with this arrangement that we had with Stanford, is really close communication so that all that post-surgery care, I'm sorry, pre-surgery, post-surgery care, the medications, that we aren't leaving the veteran in the middle to figure all of this out. And that's you know, I, I probably sound like a broken record. It is complex and it's perhaps region specific, some of the solutions, but if we had the authorities to enter into these agreements, I, I think we could find a way forward quickly. Next question. Again, if it's a problem, please address it, the problem. I basically say, well, my name is Ricky Mesa, I basically say, 
because the daddy said he had a hip brace, a uh, hip replace, and uh, I had a cornea transplant, and I basically, uh, the VA paid for it. Uh, they sent me the staff and, and uh, the status. I mean, I'm having a little step back. I can see better than what I used to. Uh, but I'm, I mean, I notice, I notice a lot of negative uh, energy. I, I, but I'm just saying, it's trying to just, I just got one question, and because uh, I put a claim in, I just want to know why it takes so long for the web to get a response. For a claim? Yeah. The gentleman right over to your right, Lee, he'll be able to address that for you. Okay. Okay, thank you. Right. Next question. How you doing? Uh, my name is Ernesto, Iraqi veteran. Um, just want to say thank you all for coming out. I got a lot of insight um, on the way the VA works, and I'm totally stoked. I'm in the HBRP program, which has helped me out a lot. My question is, I know there's, uh, you're talking about like the budgets, and there's this money not going into the VA. Um, one thing I've noticed that a lot of veterans coming back that do have pain issues or to sustain injuries or what have you, they're put on strong opiates and, you know, I'm coming in from um, off the street in Santa Cruz and I honestly came back and I thought, you know, Santa Cruz doesn't really like veterans or military personnel, so where am I going to get help? I ended up drinking myself to, I don't know what, and I found out about HRP and I went in there and I, you know, I'm psyched on it. And so I know that me not wanting to take prescription pills because a lot of people do abuse those at the end of it, instead of it helping them, it takes away from them and starts, you know, this whole crazy process of, of, of um, destroying themselves. Um, one, I was thinking about what what is a VA um, and medical marijuana instead of taking these you know pills and stuff that's going to deter your, you know de deteriorate your body and have these crazy side effects and, you know and um, there were studies of PTSD and medical marijuana and how it helped you know without all the extra side effects I mean because you can take a medicine for a runny nose and end up in the bathroom twenty five seven you know so it's like these crazy side effects and the other thing is I think wouldn't it help um, build money for the VA as well as far as getting other stuff, and that's just what I'm thinking. Well, I think we need to ask, I, I, we, we know that uh, medical me, medical uh, use of uh, marijuana is approved in California, so does the VA system, does the VA system, you can't, no. because of the feds. Yeah, as I say, the VA, the VA I heard will cut you um, yeah. from using the VA if you're yeah. caught, you know, using marijuana. So, so maybe that's have, something that should change. Yeah, really. Well, we're trying to change it. We've had many votes in Congress, but uh, uh, that we would have one policy, and the policy would be at least let the states that have voted on this and uh, approved it uh, carry it out. Uh, but so far, we have been successful with that uh, in the Congress. We, I, 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 the two of us, I, I believe, have voted the right way, but uh, uh, that's not enough. You need at least 218 in the House, and passage in the Senate and uh, and the administration being in favor of it. You make a very good point about the overutilization, uh, overprescribing of opiates within the VA system. It is a serious problem. Working with sexual assault survivors um, within the military who are now veterans, that's been one of the biggest problems, that the answer is loading them up with opiates. There have been a number of studies done that suggests that there's a much higher usage of opiates for conditions of veterans than in the general population, same age and the like. So I do think we have to address it, and I, I thank you for bringing it up. The other thing I was saying, too, is you got the methadone clinic and stuff, you know what I mean? So you're, like, taking them off a drug to put on a different drug, you know, and that's, you know, just, just saying. But thank you. Thank so, you. So for your information, too, though, there is a systematic way that primary care providers, and, and we have a... a flags of anyone whose opioid use is above a certain threshold that that has to be reviewed and verified. So, you know, to Congresswoman Spears point, we're working our way through that to address that issue. Okay. Thank you. Any other problems to be addressed? My name is Dennis. I'm a Vietnam vet. Question is to the Congresswoman about disability benefits. Um, realize a lot of the vets coming back from the recent wars have disabilities mentally and physically and it's being dealt with and I can see there's a time delay in it. However though, us older vets who are now realizing I have a lot of the same issues that I've lived with all my life, became an alcoholic, 
lost my family and my home. Um, I'm starting to apply for these benefits, but I'm realizing that it's such a, uh, a nightmare to go through. Uh, more proof, more paperwork, more time delays. Why can't the older vets system be more streamlined <coughs> to help us than they're just throwing us in the system and keeping us going in the wheels and turning? So I, I would say to you that we have been really successful in intervening on behalf of veterans who contact the office. I don't know if you're in Congresswoman Eshoo's district or my district, but if you would reach out to one of our staff members who are here, we can assist you with your claim. The backlog was at 36,000 cases out of the Oakland VA. It's been reduced substantially, not completely gone, but one of the problems that contributed to that backlog was a court decision that required that all veterans who were in Vietnam at a certain period of time um, and were subject to Agent Orange were to get benefits. So they ended up prioritizing those cases over everyone else's cases, which actually contributed to the backlog, along with some management issues. And the fact that they are still in a paper system, have not moved to electronic records until very recently, which is also part of what the problem was. Because you'd have records this thick and, and a claims adjuster trying to go through it and find the reference to a broken leg, and it was like finding a needle in a haystack. And so, Mr. Mr. Deloney is right there in the back, too, if you want to talk with him about your claim issues. I, I might add something, and, and that is that uh, whomever is a, a congressional district you reside in, and there was a gentleman that said um, he didn't want to go to a congressional office. He wanted, you know, his... Um, his issues handled right here at the VA. But uh, uh, the Congressional Office, uh, you know, works for each one of you. It's, it's paid for by the taxpayers. So we work for you. So I, I don't know what community you live in, uh, but uh, not only you, but anyone else that's here uh, should always know that you can call the Congressional Office, that the information that you share uh, with us, with our staffers, is totally confidential. That never goes to anyone else. In fact, you have to sign uh, uh, forms uh, to allow us to work on your behalf. And uh, over 22 years, we've solved a ton of cases uh, and helping people receive their uh, uh, what rightfully uh, they have earned, not just give it to someone, but what you have earned. So. Uh, uh, that's not only for your benefit, but everyone that's here. Uh, I think sometimes people feel um, uncomfortable calling a congressional office. It, it's, it, maybe at, at uh, face value it seems rather intimidating, uh, but it's not. We're, this is our work. This is why we've gone into public service, and we have a great deal of pride, not only um, in the, the people that work um, with us, uh, but because they work for you. So, um, uh, again, I don't know what community you live in, but uh, if you don't know, you can call our office here in Palo Alto. If you don't live in our congressional district, we can refer you to uh, the, uh, you know, whomever represents you. But we never turn anyone away. And uh, these cases are taken very, very seriously. And uh, uh, when we work with the congressional liaison in whatever federal department, um, you know, it's complicated. But uh, I can say that we've been successful uh, many, many times on behalf of those that have contacted us. And I know that Congresswoman Spear would say the same thing, as well as other colleagues from the Bay Area. Well, I know who my congressperson is, and I'm not intimidated, so. Good. That's <laughs> great. Good. Sir, question? Any more? Problem question? Come on. My name is Dennis, and I'm a Vietnam veteran. Uh, it's not so much a question. I had an incident that happened last year when I took some medicine that the VA gave me, and it turned out to be, uh, I had an allergic reaction to it. I live in the Central Valley, and I went to Memorial Hospital. When I got there, and I was, I was almost dead. They called the VA, and the VA said that they weren't responsible for me. I'm 60% disabled. And then they turned around, and Memorial told them, well, I gave them all my medicine. I had to surrender all the medicine I was taking, you know. And uh, they found out which one it was. 
And the memorial came back and said, well, if you don't take action on this, we're going to a higher level. And what I was told by the people at the memorial, the VA said, well, our lawyers are bigger than yours. Then when I came back here, I took some of the medicine, <laughs> snuck it away from them, and I brought it back here. I went to the administrative building, and I said, hey, okay, here, look at this. This is what happened. This is, you know, this medicine wasn't made in America. This was made somewhere else. And I found out from other vets that uh, there's like an epidemic going on. Veterans have allergic reactions to medicine that has been changed on them and has been purchased somewhere else and they have nowhere to go. They go to the hospitals and then when they complain about it, the VA steps back and says, well, since you, you went to another hospital, uh, we don't, we're not responsible for you. You might lose your benefits. Now, I've been hitting a brick wall. The VA doesn't even want to talk to me about it. They stopped uh, doing research on my, uh, my uh, PTSD and my Agent Orange. Everything's frozen. I do not know where to go. I have no way to get there. <laughs> and uh, are just think. Patient, uh, are you a patient here? Yes, I, that's I. I was here seeing the doctor today. So uh, I was just wondering, where can I go? What can I do about it? I was told by the veterans downtown that the reason they haven't done as much in that way with the uh, bad with the I'd say the bad medicine, not enough veterans died yet to have them make any changes. So we I mean, have, how we many have of us have to look into your, into your yeah. non-VA care claim? It sounds like that's one issue you have and another issue with your uh, well, claim yeah, status. We're looking to that where as can well. I, where, well, it, there's no VA hospital in the Central Valley, and I was just about to die. That was, luckily, my work uh, insurance kicked in, and that's why I was treated through my work. Yeah. And I had... I have staff here. I'd be happy to look into your into your non VA care claim. That's what it sounds like you're talking about, and, and see well, what, the, is... what the facts are. Sure. Okay. Thank you. Can I just ask a, a question about prescription drugs, though? I know that the VA is the only. It's the only uh, uh, part of the federal government where uh, there is an allowance uh, to negotiate for the lowest. Um, uh, uh, costs in prescription drugs. We tried to get that into uh, the larger health care bill and we weren't successful. Uh, but that does apply to the VA. But uh, the, the standards for those uh, prescription drugs, uh, is my understanding, has not been diminished. Uh, the gentleman is saying that uh, told that the uh, drug came from uh, that it was dangerous and it came, it, in other words, it was substandard. Yeah, we're happy to investigate his, okay. his allegation. But, right. but you should know that most drugs are not manufactured in the United States. They are manufactured abroad with certain standards that must be kept. But it's shocking to most of us to know that probably 85 to 90% of the drugs are manufactured abroad. 